All right, we're, we're jumping back into our series, our Jesus Said What series. We're going to be in Matthew's Gospel again this morning, chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24, and as you're turning there, I'm going to catch you up a little bit as to where we've been and uh, then take you where we're going. So we started out this by saying that life is full of surprises. Every day, every week, someone says something or you read something that just leaves you like, like this. It leaves you just like bum fazzled, you know, like, they just said what? Or you're like this guy. This is usually me right here. I got my mouth open like, I cannot believe they said that. It happens all the time. You hear something, you're shocked by it. It's a radical statement, something that catches you completely off guard. And it happens a lot in the, this book right here. This book right here, especially in the Gospels, when you read your little red letters where Jesus is talking, Jesus says some shocking, radical things. He says some really interesting statements. Sometimes it even looked to contradict with other statements he's made. And you're like, what's going on here? Like, Jesus said what? But we get this a lot when we look at the text. And so over this course of this series, we're looking at different statements and we'll not obviously be able to hit all of them, but I'm pulling out a few as God leads me and uh, that are important and I think that we need to hear. The first week we talked about eat my flesh and drink my blood. Jesus really said that. Eat my flesh and drink my blood. And he was just trying to encourage us to believe in him. Consume ourselves with him. And then the next week, we looked at another polarizing statement, and it goes like this. I have come to bring a sword. Or in some translations, it says, I have come to bring division. The prince of peace, the guy who is the prince of peace that came to bring peace, says, no, 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 I came. You thought I came to bring peace? I came to bring division. I came to bring a sword because I came to divide the love and the relationship that you have with me apart from any other that you might have on earth. Not even the relationship with your father or your mother or your mother-in-law or your kids even should get in the way of me because I am the one who died for you. I am the one who matters. Last week we looked at a statement that it just wasn't fair because that statement read, the last will be first and the first will be last. Jesus said it. Not me. Jesus said it. It doesn't matter how long you've been standing in line when you get so angry when someone cuts in front of you. Jesus said the last will be first. Get over it. No, no, no. We still get angry. We still get angry. We talked about this. Things just aren't fair sometimes. But if we're not careful as Christians, we can become so expectant, so entitled that we want more and more out of God. And we expect more out of Him. But his, He actually says, the Lord says, no, you're to be last. It's not about you. You're to be last. Whether you served Him for two weeks, 20 years, or 50 years, you're still last. In other words, you still need to wake up every day and think to yourself and remind yourself, I need him. I'm last without the Lord. I am last without the Lord. Such a humbling statement. Because if you have served the Lord a long time, at some point you think, maybe, maybe I'll just arrive one day. Maybe I can wake up one day in the Lord's presence and just not have to try quite as hard. No, no, you have to try hard. Each and every day as you walk it out. The last will be first and the first will be last. So today we're looking at another statement. And it's going to come out of Matthew chapter 24. As Kurt's going to throw it on the screen. And it's going to be in verse 36 is where we'll start. But about that day. And this is our statement right here. But about that day or hour. No one knows. But about that day or hour, no one knows. Well, Pastor, that's not too crazy. How is that a radical statement? Oh, we're going to get there. It goes on to say, not even the angels in heaven, 
nor the Son, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in, giving in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. This is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken, taken, excuse me, and the other left. Two women will be grinding with a hand mill. One will be taken and one will be left. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this. If the owner of the house, verse 43, if the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. So you also must be ready. So you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. May God have his blessing to his word. Maybe I should have started this series right here. Maybe I should have started week one. Maybe I got it wrong. Maybe it shouldn't have been about eating flesh and drinking blood. Maybe we should have started right here because, let's just be honest, when you start talking about the end times, when you start talking about eschatology and what's going to come, prophetic things that are going to happen, oh, oh, the scriptures get real shocking. And you're already thinking, oh, my, he's about to preach on the rapture. Hell, fire, and brimstone. Here it comes. I'm ready. I've been working on this all week. It's going to come raining down fire. You better get out your umbrellas. There's nothing more shocking and sometimes intriguing to many of us than looking at the end times. What is to come? The second coming of Jesus. The tribulation period. In a moment, I'm going to show you a scary video and convince all of you that you need Jesus. I'm kidding. We're not going into the book of Revelation today. We're not going that direction. But so many times the statements that are associated with the second coming, with the rapture of the church, they are shocking and confusing statements. They will leave you scratching your head. In fact, I think sometimes the more you study it, the more confusing, confused you get. And at the end of the day, it really doesn't matter as long as you know your life is secure in Him. I, I'm interested in the end times. But, I, but really, I don't care. I'm not being disrespectful here. Does anybody agree with me? I don't care. I don't plan on being a part of it. I plan on going to, to my heaven with my Lord and living eternity with Him. So whatever happens on this earth after I'm gone, good luck. <laughs> you see these bumper stickers, you know, on the back of cars. If the rapture takes place, this car would be unmanned. I get it. You can have my truck and my house too. It's all yours. I don't really care. But when you look at the end times, when you look at the study and the theology of what is to come, how is it all going to end or begin, depending on the way you look at it. For me, it'll be just the beginning. I'm not going to do that today, but we are going to look in Matthew chapter 24 at some of, how, some of the amazing and shocking comments that Jesus makes. Jesus spends this entire chapter, if you backtrack into this chapter and look at it later, it talks about the destruction of the temple and the end times. And Jesus says some crazy things. He says something like, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. That makes you stop and scratch your head like, Jesus said what? The sun will be darkened, the moon will no longer have light, the, the stars will fall from the sky. 
This is not some fiction book here we're reading. Jesus says the stars will fall from the sky. Now, I don't know about you, but that's that's pretty interesting to me. Not that I want to stay around and see what it looks like, but that's what he says. And then he says the heavenly bodies will be shaken. I mean, that's not stuff we talk about every day. How many of you just walk around, oh, I can't wait to the day when the stars fall from the sky. And now, oh, those heavenly bodies are going to shake. No, that's not scriptures we quote. We don't walk around quoting those things. Why? Because they're shocking statements to us. Jesus is discussing his second coming here. His return to call all of his followers to their heavenly home to be with him. And here Jesus says, but about that day or hour, look at this. But about that day or hour, no one knows. But about that day or hour when I plan to come back, no one knows. Not the angels, not me, only the Father. What? Okay, maybe, maybe the angels are not privy to this top secret information. Maybe the angels are not in the inner circle. But wouldn't you think that Jesus would know when his next appearance is going to take place? Does this not shock anybody else other than me that you don't even know when you're coming back? Now, I don't know about y'all, but I like to be in the know. I'm not nosy. I like to be in the know. There's a complete difference there. If it's something I think I should know, I don't want to be blindsided. I want to know about it. Let me in on it. If I'm Jesus, I'm going to the Father and being like, hey, man, don't you think this is something we should talk about? I won't tell the angels, but I'm your guy. But yet Jesus knows nothing. So the Father, God, knows the day and the hour. The Scripture told us that. The Father knows the day, he knows the hour of when the second coming of Jesus will take place, but Jesus does not. How is this possible? How is that possible? Because in John chapter 10, here's what Jesus says. I and the Father are one. Hold on a minute. You and... Hold on. I and the Father are one. I tell my wife everything because we're one. She knows basically everything. There's one or two things that we won't talk about here in public. I'm kidding. But she, you know, if I know it, then she can know it because I love her and trust her more than anybody. Wouldn't you think that if the Father and the Son are one, shouldn't Jesus just naturally know everything? I might not preach about the end times much today and confuse you, but this right here will confuse you. Jesus is part of the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, the, the Trinity. He's a part of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and yet he has no knowledge of when the wedding is going to take place. And he is the groom. So the Father knows, but the Son doesn't. Despite the fact that the Son is completely divine. Now I want you to think about it here. When Jesus makes this statement, he is walking the earth just like you and me. The Bible says he came down to this earth to walk out a life just like us. But yet he was sent from the Father, from the throne. He is 100% God. There's no denying that. He was not 50% God, 50% man. That's not how he was made up. Jesus was 100% holy, 100% heavenly, 100% godly, 100% divine in his nature. And yet he doesn't know and have the knowledge that the Father has who he is one with. Is anybody else confused? How can you, Jesus, be one with the Father, be completely divine like the Father, but yet you don't have the knowledge, the complete knowledge of the Father? 
I mean, I got confused just studying for this. He has knowledge of everything. God is omniscient. He knows everything past. He knows everything present. And he knows everything, as the scriptures just told us, to come. He knows the day that the second coming will take place. He knows the day and the hour. And yet Jesus, 100% divine, just like the Father, does not know. Maybe, maybe it's kind of like our culture. Maybe the parents just know. This week, we had a case of this in our house. And I started talking to Charlie. We had a parent-teacher type thing at their school this couple weeks ago, or last, this week. So we got two kids in school now, so they do these parent-teacher conference type things. And we have to go man-to-man, okay? I go with the boy, she goes with the girl. It's like, hey, we got to split up. Everybody take your side. So I go down to second grade hall, and I go and meet with Charlie's teacher, and she goes over all the details of what they're learning and what they're doing and how he's progressing and all this kind of stuff. And I'm, I'm, I'm taking notes, man. I mean, because she's going to ask me what was said. I'm sitting in there. She's got this slide showing. I'm taking pictures of every screen. I know this is going to be on the quiz later, so I'm taking pictures. And I was really interested in knowing how my child is learning, what techniques they use. So I, Charlie and I are sitting there talking this week at the table, and Mitzi is close by and hearing our conversation. And I started talking to him about math facts and math strategies, which are key words that they use in their classroom. And how he goes about calculating a correct math answer. His teacher even told us, she says, you know, the kids want to count with their fingers. Five, six, seven, eight, nine. She said, but I've told them, if you go past three numbers on your fingers, you're not doing it right. Because we don't count with our fingers. We, we learn strategies to figure out math. So I looked at Charlie and I said, do you ever count with your fingers? He's like, no, not normally. I said, good, because if you do, you can't go past three. He said, he looked at me. And then we got to talking about reading. They break it up into math and reading at this grade level. We got to talking about reading, and I said, I said, your reading seems to be going good. He said, yeah. I said, you made it into group four. He said, how do you know that? They break up the class into certain reading levels, and I'll, I'll brag, group four is the highest one. So he's doing well in his reading, and he's in group four. And he looks at me and says, how do you know that? And Mitzi, not even in the conversation, turns around and says, oh, we know everything. <laughs> Man, don't you just sit back and wait as a parent to make that statement? Oh, we see everything. You can't hide anything from us, buster. It's such a wonderful, glorified moment. Y'all will get to enjoy that. That's not what God is doing here at all. He's not, he's not pulling the parent card here. In fact, I believe that this lack of knowledge is more on Jesus' decision than it is God's. That's not in the Bible. I'm giving you my opinion here. I believe this is more on Jesus' decision not to know than it is God's not to share it. You see, Jesus was not only 100% divine, but he was also 100% human. We can't overlook that fact that, yes, he was God, but he was also man. He walked on this earth as a man, putting himself in my shoes and in your shoes, attempting to honor the Father with his life. Listen to this. Jesus, as a 100% man, sought to honor his Father with his death and until his death. That was his whole purpose. His father sent his son to die for us. Jesus certainly died for us, but he did it too to honor his father. He wanted to honor his father here. And he did it until his death. Jesus and the father are one. But Jesus was also 100% flesh just like us. And if you go back to Hebrews chapter 5, it shows us something really interesting here. Chapter 5, sorry. 
the next one. Hebrews 5. Oh, it's not on there? The next one? Oh, I'm sorry. I put the wrong one in there then. But if you go to Hebrews chapter 5, here's what it says. My bad, Kurt. The Bible says that Jesus learned in obedience. Let me lay this out for you. I'm going to land this plane right here, okay? So Jesus is 100% man. Jesus is 100% God. Jesus is the Father in one. The Father who is omniscient and knows everything. How is it that Jesus does not know about the second coming and when it will take place? Because as the man, Jesus, there are things he still does not understand and know. Oh, he was perfect. He knew all. Well, then why does the Bible say that he still learned in obedience? Jesus was still growing in knowledge because he put himself in our, fully in our position. And as he walked out this life with the Father, the Bible says he prayed with tears to the God. If he's God, then why does he even need to pray? Because he was man. He was right there where we are. In the trenches, living it out like we do as men and women. Depending completely on the Father. Jesus completely depended on God. He completely depended on him. Despite being 100% divine, despite being omniscient, Jesus was 100% just like you and me. And in his humanity, he gained knowledge of knowing what it was like to be human. He gained knowledge of what it was like to depend on the Lord. He gained knowledge in how to put himself in our position. And that helps us understand the importance of being ready for the second coming. That helps us understand the importance of looking for that day on the calendar. How does that help us? How does Jesus not knowing about the second coming help and encourage us? Because as he walked this earth, as he sought to honor the Lord unto his death, he kept his mind on the goal. He kept his mind, his focus, fixated on the finish line. Had he not, he gives up. Had he not, he backs out. Had he not, he just throws in the towel. And who could blame him? We know what he went through on this earth. Jesus didn't let things, the happenings of this world and the things of this earth distract him from the goal. Why is that important? Because he says in the beginning of this text, he says, look back to Noah. Look back to what happened when everything came crashing down in Noah's time. Noah told the people, the flood is coming. The rain is on its way. And yet the people went on about living their lives and marrying and drinking and eating and just being merry. Like nothing was going to happen. And then the flood happened. And the very few in Noah's family that trusted the Lord and were faithful to him survived it. Jesus connects the dots here from Noah's story to this story. And that story is we must be ready. If Jesus, 
the Son of God, one with the Father, doesn't know when this day is coming, how important is it for us to be ready for it? If it's such a big event that not even the Son knows about it, how much more should we be looking for that day? And I'm going to tell you, I'm preaching to, to this guy right here today. Because I'm, I'm 40 years in the making. You'll catch up. I'm 40 years in the making, and, and when I was four, I heard about the coming of Jesus. Well, 36 years later, and it's still not here. And 36 years from now, it still might not be here. But the fact is, I have to be focused on the goal, regardless. Because if Jesus doesn't know the day, what makes me think I should know the day or the hour? And so I have to be ready, Brother Tom, at each and every moment. And I can't in any way, and this is going to be easy to, to, to allow to happen, I can't in any way let the distractions of this world keep me from missing out on what the goal really is my goal is not to make a lot of money my goal is not to have the biggest house my goal is not to watch my kids grow up to be successful I hope those things happen but that is not my goal if I set those things at my go as my goal I will be left here to watch the fall, fall, stars fall from the sky and I don't want any part in that stuff so God, protect me now. Protect my mind. If Jesus, who is all-knowing, he could have taken himself off the cross. We've heard that preached. He had the power to do whatever he wanted to end the suffering that he went through. Certainly he has the power to go out there, Randy, and find the knowledge of when he's going to come back. He chooses not to. And we shouldn't worry about when it's going to happen either. We should just know that it is coming. If we get too wrapped up in eschatology and the end times and what's becoming, what's coming down the road, then we're going to be so confused and wore out and not even be ready when it happens. It'll be so obvious to us, we completely won't even see it. I believe that we can be too... I believe we can be too heavenly that we're no earthly good. Y'all picking me up? I believe we, we can be too heavenly that we're no earthly good. But I also believe we can be too earthly that we're no heavenly good. What does that mean, Pastor? We've got to have balance. We can't be like the people in Noah's day that where we just... Turned our, turned our eyes from it and said, ah, that's, that's never going to happen. I'm going to go on about living my life. Jesus is not telling you not to live your life. He's not telling you not to eat and drink and, and be joined together in marriage. He's not telling you not to do those things. But there has to be balance. Because if we're too heavenly and we're too focused on the things of, of heaven and of, of God and the end times... We're never going to be any good to the people that God's called us to go minister to. But if we're too earthly, we're going to miss out on that heavenly call home. There has to be balance. God, help me to enjoy this life you've given me. Help me to enjoy my family and my friends and my church and the places I live and the things that I do and the career that I have. To take advantage of all the blessings you've given me. But at the same time, help me to be focused on the end goal and to keep things in perspective. Keep the main thing the main thing. And that is one day being called home as the bridegroom of Christ. I can't wait. And God forbid any of us miss that call when the trumpet sounds. It's not fire and brimstone. It's encouragement. Why would you want to live any other way? Sister Don, I have, this world has nothing 
for me. My eyes are fixed on Jesus this morning. And he'll